we've talked about the way to deliver data through a network, switching, and that we need to find a path through a network. Now we're going to look at uh, or define some different types of networks uh, that are used in practice. Um, some of them use switching on a, on a large scale, that is our large network. Some are uh, much smaller networks which may not require many switches, maybe one or even zero. Uh, so we'll see that these actually are the types of networks we talk about are, are sub-networks in a larger network often. That is, the internet is built from joining many small networks together. What are those small networks? Lands and, and wide area networks. So let's talk about those smaller networks or component networks. And mainly today it's going to be starting with some terminology, some way that we classify different networks, and then some very basic concepts that are common to many networks. So some of the issues that we deal with. First, let's try and categorize networks. There are many different types of computer networks in use. When we want to compare them and talk about them, well, we can classify them in different ways. And some ways we can classify are listed here. That is, we can classify networks based upon the transmission medium. Is it a wired network or a wireless network? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll list some examples of each as, as we go through. Uh, will we? Yes, we'll talk about the trade-offs of, of the, the difference between a wired network and a wireless network. We can classify based upon the link configuration. Does the network use point-to-point -point links or point-to-multipoint? Point-to-multipoint, remember one person transmits, multiple receive. Point-to-point, -point, one transmits, one receives. So the link configuration may be different and we, we may have uh, different designs depending upon whether we use point-to-point -point or point-to-multipoint and different performance. We can classify based upon whether the user of the network, the person using the computers to transfer data, is fixed or mobile. So we can talk about fixed networks. The network's not fixed, but the users inside that network are fixed. The devices are generally in the one position. Or mobile networks, where the users may move around, and therefore we need to design the network to support that mobility. The types of users. So the users may be you and I, the, the human users who, who are the source of data or the ultimate destination of the data. But in some cases, we'll have networks that don't support the individual end users but carry the data of a group of end users. So we distinguish sometimes and talk about the, the users where the, the end users access a larger network, those small networks we'll refer to as access networks, and then the data from those users accessing the network may be sent via another network and that other network has the goal of just forwarding data of many users a core network or a backbone network. And we'll show a picture to, to compare them. And the last one is based upon coverage area. How big is the network, the, the physical size uh, of the network? We'll classify based upon coverage area. So let's look at them briefly. What transmission medium should you use for your network? Well, wired or wireless? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each? And you're doing your assignment and you're doing some experiments with a wired network versus a wireless network. And you may see in terms of performance, one in general is better than the other. What's the difference? Well, the pluses and minuses. The plus are the positive and then the minus the, the negatives. And they're almost the inverse of each other. That is, with wired networks, when we have separate wires connecting our stations together, our computers together, the interference is very low. That is, I have a wire going from my laptop to the PC, a LAN cable for example, and from your laptop to another PC via a LAN cable. When we both transmit at the same time along those separate cables, the transmissions don't interfere with each other. My transmission is contained within that cable, your transmission is contained within your cable, then there's very small interference the way the cables are designed that the, the signal stays within there. It doesn't uh, come out so much. 
as a result, with little interference, we can transmit signals and uh, what's received is, is uh, very little noise, very little interference, so that the good quality of the signal received, which translates in the end to higher data rates, can be achieved. We can get high data rates, high speeds. Whereas with wireless, uh, the second, the first negative point under wireless, there's generally interference. Not in all cases, but uh, in many cases with wireless networks, when my laptop transmits to the access point on the wall and your mobile phone at the exact same time tries to transmit to the same access point on the wall, because with wireless our signal propagates in all directions normally, sometimes we can have highly directional antennas, but in, in many cases the signals propagate in all directions and the result is that the access point hears or receives the transmissions by, from both my laptop and your mobile phone and those signals overlap at the receiver and the receiver cannot interpret what data I sent or what data your mobile phone sent because it receives a signal which is a combination of both of the transmitted signals and it cannot make out what the data was sent. So with wireless, because our signals propagate in all directions, or in, not necessarily with an omnidirectional antenna, but in multiple directions, then they may interfere with the other transmissions. And interference means that the receiver cannot understand what was sent, which means that less data can be successfully delivered. We get, in the end, lower data rates. The same if if everyone starts talking in this lecture at the same time, then you will not be able to uh, clearly understand what I'm saying because the transmissions from the other people will interfere with what I'm saying. So that's a big problem with wireless. With wired, we have very little interference, so we can get a higher data rate. With wireless, we have interference, so uh, we get poorer performance when we compare them. With wired, it's easier to upgrade the capacity to get even higher data rates by generally adding a new wire. For example, my LAN cable between laptop and PC supports one gigabit per second. I plug it in. All right, so the capacity of my network is one gigabit per second. What if I want two gigabits per second? I go and buy another LAN card for both computers and plug a second cable in. And now I've got two gigabits per second between those two devices. Very easy to upgrade by just making sure we, have, uh, we, we can support a second cable there. Because the transmissions across those two cables do not interfere with each other. So with wired networks we can upgrade the capacity by just adding another wire or a cable. We can't do that with wireless, because with wireless, we, when everyone transmits using the same range of frequencies, they essentially interfere with each other. How do we add more capacity in that case? Well, the only way to do it would be to use different frequencies. That is, I can transmit to the access point at a rate of 100 megabits per second with a wireless technology. Then if there's a second person who wants to transmit to that same access point at 100 megabits per second, because of interference, effectively we'll only get half of that 100 megabits per second each. I will get to transmit 50% of the time, the other person will transmit 50% of the time, getting 50 megabits per second each. That's the problem with interference. We effectively divide that capacity by the number of users. How do we upgrade? We can't just add another access point because we still use the same range of frequencies. What we can do is use a different range of frequencies, a different channel. I transmit to the access point using channel 1. You transmit to a different access point using channel 6, if we think of Wi-Fi. And the signals will then not interfere because we're using different range of frequencies. That's a way to increase the capacity. but we're using more bandwidth in total to do that. More bandwidth incurs more cost. We can't just add an infinite number of frequencies. We're limited on the range of frequencies we can use. 
So with wired, we can get higher data rates, and it's easy to upgrade to increase the speed, add a new wire. And related to no interference, that the delay is usually small across cables and usually predictable. Every packet I send has about the same delay. And you may ex see that when you run your experiments across your LAN link. When you ping the other computer, the, the values reported are about the same all the time. With wireless, because there is interference, I may send a packet. Uh, it may, may not get there. I have to send again. Retransmissions incur extra delay. But what most many wireless systems, including Wi-Fi, de are designed to do is that because there is interference, they follow a protocol such that only one station transmits at a time. Again, my laptop wants to send to the access point. Your phone wants to send to the access point. Then they follow a protocol such that the aim is that if we both want to send, only one of them will transmit at a time. Maybe my access point transmits first, and then your phone transmits. If there are 10 devices, maybe they can take in turns. And the problem with that is that from my device's perspective, I get to transmit, and then I have to wait for everyone else to transmit. So there's a delay for when I can send my next packet. At the end today, we may talk about if, uh, briefly the ways that we can take in turns allow other devices to transmit. So with wireless, the poor performance may include varying delay. And again, I think you'll see that if you do a ping across your wireless LAN, those values reported in ping will get different uh, delays. We can even try that now. I'm connected via Wi-Fi from my laptop to the access point, and I'm pinging from mine to another computer on the third floor, 10.10.6.1. We see the delays are in the order of milliseconds, but some of them jump up. Here we had about two. The average is around six, but we have one here of 15 milliseconds, several at one millisecond. This one was 69 milliseconds three milliseconds. So we see the variance there. That's because when my laptop wants to send the message, then the protocol that the wireless technology is using is designed such that of all the devices in the area that want to send, only one will transmit at a time. So sometimes mine will have to wait for your phone to transmit. So I want to send but uh, there's some delay in waiting for others to send. So that's why we may get uh, the higher delays. Maybe the, at that particular time, other devices were wanting to send. Sometimes I get to send first, so I get a small delay of one millisecond. So that will depend upon how many other devices are wanting to send. If we did it across a wired LAN, you'll see that it's uh, about constant through, through those different pings. What else about wired versus wireless? What's the problem with wired? It's expensive to install, especially when in locations where it's hard to access. Okay? That is, we have to install the cables. So if we've got a building and we want to have network coverage, then it may be difficult to put the cabling through the building rather than we don't want to lay it on the floor so people trip over it or it looks bad. We want to put it in hidden locations and that can be difficult in some cases. Or we want to cover across a city. We want to have wired link links across a city. Then we have to get uh, permission to dig holes under the, under the, the roads, under the the, the land owned by different people, and that's an expensive operation. The other problem with wired is that the devices are typically fixed. I plug a LAN cable into my laptop, I can't move it very far, maybe within a couple of metres, but, but depending on the length of the LAN cable. If it's wireless, I can move my laptop essentially anywhere that provides coverage from the, the wireless access points. 
So wired leads to fixed networks normally. Wireless allows for mobile networks, mobile users inside the network. And that's the key advantage of wireless. No physical connection. We allow mobility and it's convenient. Even my laptop just sits here. It's not really mobile. I don't have to plug in a LAN cable to get the network access. It's convenient. Another problem with wireless systems is that because many people want to transmit using the same frequencies, we need to have some rules about who can use those frequencies. So often there's a license required to use those frequencies. So with mobile phone systems, you can't go and build your own mobile phone network, put up some base stations. You must get a license to use the range of frequencies that the mobile phones will transmit and receive on. So the mobile phone operators pay a lot of money to get those licenses. With Wi-Fi unlicensed, that is we don't have to pay a license to use Wi-Fi, so there's some range of frequencies which are classified as unlicensed. But with those, the more people using it, the lower the performance I will get. So that's the problem with unlicensed bands, that anyone can use it, the more people, the lower the individual performance. Last thing, wireless, physical security is difficult. With a wired network inside SIT, the LAN cable going from the, the desktop on the, here to the switch downstairs, for someone to listen in on the tra transmissions, so we transmit a signal from the desktop to a device downstairs along the cable, for someone to intercept that data, they need physical access to the cable. What they could do, if they want to intercept the data on my wired network, they need to come into the building and maybe put a special tap or intercept on the, the LAN cable and then they can intercept everything I send, ignoring encryption. So to get access to a wired network from a security perspective, an attacker needs physical access to the network. They need to come to the cable, to the building and so on. But with wireless, when my laptop transmits up to the access point, the signal is also going outside. So maybe someone standing outside the building, not even on our campus, may receive the signal transmitted by my access point, uh, by my uh, laptop and also by the access point in the opposite direction. So there's no physical security there. That is, an attacker doesn't have to be inside the building to intercept the data that I send. So it's much harder to provide that physical security and wireless systems. So we need to make sure we use encryption so that even though someone can receive the signal, they cannot understand the data that was transmitted. And we'll cover that next semester in the security course. So that's our first choice. We've got wired and wireless networks and we would choose the medium depending on our requirements. Any questions on wired versus wireless? especially since your assignment is really comparing wired and wireless. So you, you, you're studying that a lot. Let's get through the others a bit faster. The link configuration, point to point, that is a pair of users have their own link, a dedicated link. And as a result, there's only two users using that link so that the performance they'll get is is usually high and predictable. There's no one else that we need to share that link with. Therefore, we know what performance we'll get when we transmit across that link. When we have point to multipoint, then we usually require some way for sharing that medium, for sharing that link, so that we uh, allow each user to transmit. And wireless is a good example there. Again, everyone wants to transmit their data from their laptop, their mobile phone, up to this access point. You all want to transmit data using the same frequency at the same time. If you all transmit at the same time, all of your signals will interfere and the access point won't understand anything that any of you send. And that's bad. So we have 
what's called medium access control protocols such that your phone and laptop follow some rules with the aim that only one of you will transmit at the same time. So the rules will be, right, this device gets to send, then the next device gets to send, and then another one gets to send, and so on, so that they don't create interference. That leads to lower performance because you have to wait for all the others to transmit. You'll get lower throughput, uh, higher delay. So that's the problem with point to multipoint links that because multiple people may transmit and receive, we must share the medium amongst them. We don't get dedicated performance for ourselves. And there's some complexity in doing this medium access control which leads to some overhead. What's the problem with point to point? If we want to cover many users, we need many links. There's some cost involved. And we need to plan the endpoints. So if we want to connect everyone in this room, then we'd need many cables to connect everyone together so that we can all talk to everyone else. With a point to point, point to multi-point system, maybe if I want to communicate to everyone else, then I transmit, and with a wireless system, everyone can receive. That's very easy. Point to point doesn't always relate, uh, connect with wired links. So wired links are commonly point to point. But we can have wireless links. When we use directional antennas, they are effectively point to point. On the top of the other building on our campus, we have an antenna pointing to our Rungsit campus. And it's a highly directional antenna, which essentially creates a point to point wireless link. Those devices, when they transmit, only ones receive because the antennas align such that the signal will just go in that direction. We will got, not get interference from others. Point to multipoint wireless links like Wi Fi, mobile phones. But also, there are some wired technologies that use point to multipoint communications, bus type technologies. Old LANs used to be such that my desktop will transmit onto the LAN cable and everyone would receive that transmission. So in the old LAN, uh, old Ethernet, it was a point to multipoint topology. We'll see some pictures and examples of different topologies shortly. The other classification was uh, with respect to users. And here's a, a, a simple view of a large network which is made up of many smaller networks. So think if we have one large network. The, the PCs are the users, the sources and destinations. And any PC wants to communicate with any other. Well, one common setup with large networks is that we use some technology for the user to access that large network. And that network itself we refer to as an access network. That's where the end user gets access to the larger network. But, and there may be multiple access networks. Then we have some other networks to connect those access networks together. So there's different naming for those uh, intermediate networks. Here we may call it a core network. So these two access networks connect via this core network. And we may have multiple core networks and maybe a backbone network that connects all of them together. The point here is that the end users access the larger network via the access networks, the core and backbone networks don't have end users directly attached. There's no person with sitting in their computer directly connected to the core network. The core and backbone networks are designed just to transfer the data from access network to access network. The result is that the designs of those networks, the technology selected, may be different. The core networks and backbone have to be designed to carry a large amount of traffic, a large amount of data. So we need high speed links, we need multiplexing. Often reliability mechanisms are important. The access networks are need to be designed to make it easy for the individual users to connect. 
An example may be Wi-Fi is an access network or a wired LAN or a mobile phone system or ADSL and then the networks operated by the, the SIT, by uh, internet service providers, telecom companies, they are the core network and backbone networks using uh, wired LAN, optical fibre, uh, maybe dedicated point-to-point -point wireless links. So that's another classification of networks. Last one. How big is the network? And here we often hear some uh, acronyms that are a measure of how big the networks are. How much area do they cover? And there are many different names here and there's no defined standard as, as to the names, how big they are, but I've given some rough uh, measures of the area that the networks cover and some example technologies. So we can start, some networks are built to cover a small area in the order of centimetres. And some, maybe it's a network to connect devices on your body. That is, connect your mobile phone to your earpiece using Bluetooth, for example, or connect multiple devices that you carry with you. Not necessarily on your body, but nearby. Or maybe it's just for connecting on your desk to connect your uh, laptop to your monitor wirelessly. Okay? An example of a, a small area network, a body area or personal area. Uh, using technologies like Bluetooth, you know, I think you've all probably used Bluetooth or you've got your devices that support it, uh, but there are others, infrared technologies. Um, Zigbee is a technology for similar to Bluetooth, but for low rate, low data rate communications, for things like uh, reporting status data. So not having to send a lot of data, but over a small distance, and you can use a, a wireless connection which doesn't consume much battery power. So the battery can last not for a day like your mobile phone, but can last for uh, weeks and months. And there are other wireless technologies primarily wireless technologies that support covering across a very small area. Body area networks, personal area networks are some of the names. Then if we move up and think about how do we connect across uh, inside our home, inside an office or an office building, then we're talking about networks that cover meters several metres, tens of metres, maybe even hundreds of metres in some cases. Well, often they're referred to as a local area network. The network is covering just a local area, a LAN. Okay, so that's the main uh, acronym that we'll see arise. Sometimes if it's specific to the home, it may be a home area network, or maybe if it's for specific for storing data, that is, a company needs to store data on a number of different storage devices, then those devices may be connected via a network, storage area network. What technologies are used there? Ethernet, our wired LAN technology. The formal standard created by the organisation called IEEE and the number of the standard, the document that describes Ethernet, is 802.3. This organisation, IEEE, has created standards for many different wired and wireless technologies in the LAN space and, and also wide area networks. So they created the standard for Ethernet, IEEE 802.3, but also for Wi-Fi, IEEE 802.11 is the standard by the same organisation that says how do I transmit from my laptop to the access point wirelessly. And within these standards, there are many uh, variations and improvements. If you've, in your assignment, looked at your Wi-Fi access point, you'll see that it may support different substandards. 802.11a, .11b, g, n, ac. They are just substandards or, or variations of the original. 
and they're primarily designed to support across a local area. Sometimes they're used to, to build larger networks, but the main design and motivation to support uh, in homes, offices and buildings. And there are some others as well. They're not the only two. Then we move up and think about how do we build a network that covers across a city, that connects between cities, so across countries, and eventually uh, between countries. And across cities, referred to as metropolitan area networks, more generally, across cities, between countries, a wide area networks, a WAN, lands and WANs talking about distance of kilometres, tens of kilometres, hundreds of kilometres, maybe even a thousand. And these networks are often ac uh, core networks and backbone networks. So wide area networks are often run by one company and that, that company really leases or rents the access to that network to others that have access networks. Because they may be very expensive to run and operate, then they, those wide area networks are built to carry the, the data from different access networks. So the access networks may be via LANs, which then connect to a wide area network to transport the data across a, a larger distance. Those networks needed to be designed to carry a lot of data. Not just the data from one or a few users, but the data from tens of or hundreds of users or thousands of users. So they need to be high capacity. Uh, they need to transmit that data across long distances. And they need to be quite reliable. Imagine the network that transports the data from um, one of the internet service providers in Thailand, like uh, um, True, True Corporation has a, has a gateway that connects to other countries. So there are links from the True International Internet Gateway in Thailand that goes to Singapore, to Japan, Malaysia and, and, and other countries. Those links are essentially wide area network links or wide area networks. And they need to carry the data from not just you and I, but from thousands of users. If the link fails or the network fails, then thousands of customers are unhappy. So reliability is an important part of these large networks. They may have backup links or backup paths so that they can automatically switch over to a backup link so that even if one part fails, the rest of the network can deliver the data. So there are different technologies used there. Many of them are wired technologies, but there's also wireless technologies. Uh, some of them are listed here. PDH and SDH are um, wired, wired technologies really for, uh, for high capacity links across cities between countries. If you look on the later slides in this uh, lecture, which we won't get time to go through, there's some listing of the the data rates for PDH and SDH. They, they go from tens of megabits per second up to uh, 10, 10 or more gigabits per second. And they are commonly used, say, for links between countries uh, and, and across a country. And there are some other technologies. ATM is not about money, but it's about a way to transfer data using packet switching, virtual circuit packet switching. And frame relay was an older version. And then some wireless technologies. WiMAX is a, uh, some, there's some relationship with IEEE 802.11 Wi-Fi. It allows usually long distance wireless links, often point to point. And satellite is another option, satellite access, net, uh, satellite networks. That covers between countries. What if we want to cover the whole Earth or even go beyond Earth? Then we're talking about, what, megameters, tens, hundreds, thousands of kilometres, even more. 
Well, we can think that may be a global area network. The internet, which is really the, made up of connecting many different LANs and WANs together, well, that's what the internet is, connection of multiple different networks, covers the globe. And if you go beyond the Earth, the connections to the uh, uh, to satellites, the connection to to spaceships uh, the, around Mars and other other spaceships, we can think of an interplanetary networks. We will not look at those. So we are going to focus primarily on lands, which cover the the home, office, building type size networks and mention a little bit about wide area networks which are connecting across cities, between cities, between countries. Any questions about these classifications of networks? Just be aware that we talk about networks from different perspectives. Medium, link configuration, the user, the coverage area. Did I miss one? We didn't talk about user mobility, okay? That is, some networks support users being mobile, some they assume that the users don't move. Um, another comparison of wide area networks versus local area networks. And now when I say a wide area network, I will also mean a metropolitan area network, which is covering a city. And when I say a LAN, I also mean a home area network or a storage area, area network, which are really sub-cases of a LAN. And in fact, sometimes a, a personal area network is close to a LAN as well. We may have similarities. So comparing a, from a different perspective of WAN versus a LAN, some of the differences, wide area networks connect devices or networks over a large geographical area, wide area. For example, between campuses, the links between Bunkadi and Rangsit, we can think the technologies, uh, a, a wide area network. Between office buildings, okay, if you have offices in different locations, and between cities and countries. Often those networks are owned and operated by organisations on behalf of the users. That is, the networks are owned and operated by internet service providers or telecom companies. Those owners of the network are not the end users of the network. What they do is they build the network, own and operate it, and rent or lease out access to other companies and organisations. For example, SIT, we have a wired link uh, or a, a path from between our two campuses and we, we pay another company to operate that link. So another company owns that link, they, they build it, they, they maintain it. We just pay them to carry our data across their, their link. So they own the wide area network but we, it's our data that carries across that link. That link may carry other people's data at the same time. So the wide area network may be designed to not just carry one user's data, but the data of many users. So they at least access to those networks at least to other users. Universities, companies, maybe smaller internet service providers. Local area networks usually connect the end user devices. Within a campus, buildings, homes, often, not always, but often, the LAN is owned and operated by the organisation using the network. What I mean is that the wired LAN inside our campus is owned and operated by SIT and the users of that wired LAN are the, the SIT desktops and computers. Okay, that is, the end users are part of the organisation that own and operate the network. And that has a difference on, in terms of what options we have to select the technology. That is, if we're going to build a new network, we're the, we're the person using that network 
So we choose the technology best for us. With a wide area network, we have to rely on the other organisations to choose the technology. We can just go to them and say, I want to access you from this location to this other location. What do you have on offer? We don't get to choose the, the network technology. Typically, not always again, LANs will support higher data rates than wide area networks. Now, that's a bit strange when we look at some examples. What I mean is, well, uh, one example you are aware of, uh, anyone have ADSL internet access or has used it at home or somewhere? What data rates do you get with ADSL? Anyone know? Eight megabits per second, so in the order of several megabits per second, maybe one uh, down, uh, upload, maybe eight or ten up download, you can get faster. So think of that as our part of our wide area network connection. Because in fact, for us to access the ADSL, we use usually Wi-Fi or wired LAN. You may have a, the router which gives you access inside your home. How fast is your Wi-Fi or wired LAN? How many megabits per second? You're doing the assignment on it. How fast you, is your wired LAN? 100 megabits per second. Wi-Fi ranges, maybe 54, but that's uh, maybe quite old now. Most new devices support uh, more than 100 megabits per second with Wi-Fi. There's an example that our link to the, through the ISP is only 8 or 10 megabits per second, but in turn, internal for the LAN, we can get 100, 100 plus megabits per second. The LAN gives higher data rates than the, the WAN, the wide area network. Why? Well, traditionally, if you think of now SIT, the LAN supports 1 gigabit per second. But our link from SIT out to the internet is not 1 gigabit per second. You may notice if you start to download a lot from outside of SIT, then it's maybe several megabits per second, right? tens of megabits per second. Internally, we have a 1,000 megabits per second. The connection out is in the order of tens of megabits per second. So again, much higher internal than the external link. Why? Traditionally, many organizations, a lot of the data was internal communications. Okay, inside a business, I'm not always accessing public internet uh, websites and so on. Often inside the business, we're accessing internal servers. We're communicating internally. Therefore, we need enough capacity to support internal communications plus external communications. The link outside only needs enough capacity to support the external communications, not internal. So traditionally, the the LAN had a higher data rate and higher needs than the external link. Nowadays it's changing a bit in that a lot of applications, even for businesses, are not hosted internally but are hosted out on the internet and therefore a lot of communications is via the external link. Now, even though SIT's link from our campus out to the internet, maybe in the order of 10 megabits per second, the, the cable that carries SIT, SIT's traffic out may support a much higher data rate because it well, may be carrying the data of multiple users. We may use multiplexing. So maybe there's an optical fiber network owned by TOT that SIT uses and we send our data from our campus to Rungsit, but that network also carries data from other organizations. So the network may be, the WAN may have a lower per user data rate, but higher uh, in terms of the total network capacity. So that's just a rough comparison between wide area and local area networks. Let's look at, for, for both of those types of networks, some common topologies. 
the topology is how we arrange the nodes and links. Let's say we want to build a network where we have many devices, many end user devices. We want to allow each end user device to communicate with every other end user device. That's a, a, a common goal that if I have a hundred desktops in my, uh, in my network, I want to allow anyone to communicate with anyone else. So how do we connect those devices together? What links do we create? Well, that's the topology. And there are some different choices. Now we'll talk about the, the, the devices that the end users use that create data and uh, the destinations of data. Sometimes we call them simply stations, hosts or end nodes. But in some networks we have some intermediate devices that will support the data transfer and they may be referred to as switches, repeaters and hubs. Especially when we talk about LANs, those names will come up. So let's look at four or five different topologies that are common that we can choose from. And we'll look at it from the perspective of LANs, but in fact they also apply for wide area networks. And note that the links we'll be able to choose from as either point to point or point to multi point. So we'll go through mesh, bus, ring, and star. And a hybrid is simply combining two or more of the above together. Before we look at them, what's our requirements? What do we want? We should allow any station to be able to communicate with any other station. If we don't, that's not a, a good network design. Generally, using point-to-point -point links gives us better performance than point-to-multipoint links. So when possible, use point-to-point -point links, but there may be some limitations of them. So if I have a point-to-point -point link and the capacity is 100 megabits per second, then we can transfer that full 100 megabit per second between the two devices. If it's a point-to-multipoint link with a capacity of 100 megabits per second, then the performance each user gets depends upon the number of users. We'd like to use as few links as possible. Think of the links, maybe cables. The less we use, the easier it is to install, the easier to upgrade, the less cost involved. We'd like a network that scales well. What that means is when we add new nodes, new stations, that it's easy to add them. For example, I've got currently 100 nodes in my network. I build the network. I want to add another 10 more. It should be easy to add those 10 more. We shouldn't have to change the current network to add 10 new ones. We'd like the network to be fault tolerant. That is, I've got my network and there's a failure, one link fails. Not all links, but one of the links fails. Then maybe the two devices connected via their link cannot communicate, but the other devices still should be able to communicate if one link fails. If one link fails and that causes no one to be able to communicate, then maybe that's not a good network design. Similar, fault detection. Sometimes it's nice to be able to automatically detect if there is a failure. That is, a link fails. How do I know that link failed? Well, firstly, that the users of that link may come to me and say, your link's not working, please fix it. Maybe that takes some minutes or hours before I know that. Automatic detection would be the link fails and immediately there's a packet sent to some special server saying, this link has failed and then maybe some correction uh, action can take place and get a new link. Fault detection is very important for large networks, wide area networks. The link fails, automatically the different link is used as a backup. So given those requirements, let's compare four different topologies that are common. First one's mesh.
And the example is we have six stations, A, B, C, D, E, F, and we want to connect them using links. And a mesh topology, we use point-to-point -point links and have a link between every pair of devices. So we see the mesh here, a full mesh, in that station A has a point-to-point -point link to B, to C, D, E and F, and similar B has links to every other device. This is good for performance with point-to-point -point links everywhere then the performance between each pair of nodes is guaranteed. That is, assuming every link is a data rate of 100 megabits per second, A can be sending data to B at 100 megabits per second and at the same time to C and at the same time to D, E and F. Those links are dedicated for the, the two endpoints. There's no sharing. That's good. What's the problem with a mesh topology? Cost? Why? Why is it costly? Many, many cables, many links. Right? You can see in the picture there are many links necessary. How many links here? Someone count them for me. How many cables do we need? Did you count them? How many lines between the devices? Sorry. A has links to five others. B has links to four others. C has links to three others. Two, D to two others and E to one other. That is, we don't count them twice. 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 15. There are 15 links in this case. Let's grow it to a real size network. Say inside SIT we want to connect, we have 100 devices. We want to use a full mesh. How many links do we need? Well, the general formula, the, the number of pairs of devices, how many are there? It's n times n minus 1 over 2. That is, here we have 6 devices. The number of pairs is 6 times 5 divided by 2. 30 divided by 2, 15. With 100 devices, the number of pairs, the number of links, is 100 times 99 divided by 2, which is about 5,000. Okay, we need less than 5,000 links. So, I think you realise the more devices we add, the more links we need. And that becomes very costly to deploy and actually difficult to run all those links through the, the space. Of course, the other problem, every device needs multiple links plugged into it. Device A has five cables plugged into it. So we need a, a network interface card that supports those five links. So that's not very practical. Good for performance, not good for uh, the practical purposes of deploying those links uh, and um, making the devices simple. So not commonly used in large networks, only suitable very small networks. Uh, maybe when we need very high performance like in small wide area networks, we want to connect devices and we want good performance between every pair, maybe a mesh is okay, a full mesh. Note that we don't need any form of addressing. When we use point-to-point -point links, when I send something on the link, who does it go to? Well, it goes to the other endpoint. I don't need to say in the, the message that I send who is, the, who is the destination because there's only one possible destination. We'll see in the other approaches we will need some form of addressing so we can identify who is the destination. So when I transmit a frame from A to B, that frame contains some data, we don't necessarily need to include the address of the destination in that frame because the destination, if A transmits, it always will be B on this link. There's only one possible destination. 
So mesh is possible but not very practical for, for large networks. We could have a partial mesh, not connect all of them together. That saves on our links. What's the problem? Can A talk to F? Well, assuming that the other devices do not forward data, then A cannot talk to F. Assuming the role of the devices is either to create data to send or to receive data for themselves, I will not send data for other, on behalf of other people, then in this case A cannot talk to F. And we set our requirement, we want to allow everyone to talk to everyone else. So that's a problem with a partial mesh topology that we may not allow some pairs to communicate. If we do allow some nodes to connect to forward data, that is, if I allow, for example, D to forward data, what I can do, maybe every node to forward data, to send from A to F, I could send from A to B. B realises I'm not the destination, so it sends to D, which then sends on to F. That's our switching. Okay, we've covered that in switching. We can do that. If B and D are switches, in terms of packet or circuit switches, we can deliver the data from A to F. But if they are not switches, they're just end stations, like a laptop or PC, we can't communicate between A and F. This may be used in some wide area networks when we don't necessarily need to communicate between all pairs. So let's look at some other uh, topologies primarily used in local area networks. First one is a bus topology. What we do is we have a special link that the six devices attach to, and that special link we refer to as a bus. And you, you've studied bus topologies, or you may have heard of them in computer architecture, when you think we have between the components inside a computer, they can communicate via a bus, a communications bus, the same concept here. What we do is that when A wants to transmit, it has an attachment to this bus link. So this solid uh, line is the, a cable, you think in practice, is a cable that passes every computer. And each computer attaches, has a special attachment to that, that one cable. So there's one long link, and everyone has very, even though it's shown to be long for D, but has usually small devices that attach to that cable. And what happens when A wants to transmit to F, A transmits onto the bus, and the bus usually is designed so that the transmission goes to everyone attached to it, and everyone includes F, so F, everyone receives a copy of that transmission, and we include the address of the destination inside the frame, so when A transmits, it sends a frame, destination F. The bus delivers that frame to everyone connected to the bus. B gets it, notes the destination is F and ignores it. C gets it and ignores the frame. F gets the frame and accepts the frame because it is the destination. This bus link is a multipoint, point to multipoint link. One transmits, multiple points receive. It's not a point-to-point -point link. This was used in early wired LANs. Okay, so before we had the, the, the current LAN topologies, what we'd have is a long cable that passes via every computer, usually desktops in those days. And the desktops at the back of the LAN card will have a special attachment that connects onto that bus link. And your computer would transmit, everyone would get a copy, but only the one who was a destination would take a copy. The others would discard the copy. So that's why we need addresses in the frame. The, the bus link had some special terminating points to, to, uh, to end the link. It was rather, the advantage was it was rather easy to install. We don't need multiple cables like in the mesh topology. We just need one link passing every device. 
So let's say we have an office building. What we would do is we'd have a long cable that just runs past every computer, and each computer would attach onto that, connect to the bus. So not hard to install. Now, the link, the bus link is a point to multipoint link. The problem with point to multipoint links is that we must share that medium amongst multiple users. It's not dedicated for just a pair of users. The result was that only one user could transmit at a time. If A is transmitting data to F, then B cannot be transmitting data to E at the same time. That bus link is shared, so only one user would transmit at a time. The result is that if the link capacity is 100 megabits per second, on average, the amount that each user can get is that 100 divided by the number of users. 100 divided by 6 in this case. 16 megabits per second. So with a point to multipoint link, roughly we can say we divide the capacity by the number of users using that link. If we had 100 devices attached and the capacity was 100 megabits per second, roughly each user would get 1 megabit per second each. We don't get the full 100 each. And so to share the medium, it required protocols to do that automatically, and it r resulted in lower performance. One problem was if the bus fails, no one can communicate. And that was so an issue if there was some error here that normally then it stops everyone from communicating, and that's not good fault tolerance. There were some practical limits on how long the bus could be and how many devices could attach. So in, in the old lands, there were some limits. You couldn't just have one long b bus that covers uh, thousands of metres through a building. So this was used in earlier lands, but not very common anymore. It was replaced by the star topology, which we'll see. Similar to a bus, almost the same, but we connect the two endpoints. So instead of having that, that one link with terminating points, connect the two endpoints of the bus and you get a ring topology. Same concept. A transmits onto the ring and the frame is transmitted all the way around where each device gets a copy of that transmission and the one that is indicated as the destination takes a copy and processes it, the others ignore the message. So very similar to the, the bus topology. Note that usually the transmission would happen in one direction. Essentially A transmits and it goes, the, the signal goes past F, F gets a copy and the signal keeps going past E, E gets a copy and so on. It comes back to A and then the signal terminates, or the, the, the frame is removed from the ring. Again, similar to the bus, not hard to install compared to a mesh especially. It was one of the advantages is it was easy to identify faults. That is, if there's some portion of the link that's not working, then by sending a message around we'd identify which device or which portion of the link is not working. That is, if this, the message always goes clockwise. We go from A and it goes around to F and back to A. If we send a message and the link from D to E, that portion is not working or D is, uh, or E is not working, if we send a message around, it will get to D, it will not get to E. So we've now identified which portion of the link has, has a fault. D got it, E didn't get it, so that must be there in the link. And that's an important feature in large networks where we want quick notification of faults, especially in wide area networks. Covering a city or a country, we have a ring network, and if there's a fault, we can quickly detect that and fix it. It was used in very old lands, but again, not very common, except where those old legacy networks are still in use. The concept of a ring topology is used in some larger metropolitan and wide area networks. This fault tolerance, so fault detection is an important feature. 
larger networks would have a ring in each direction and even backup rings. I transmit around this direction. If I want to send from A to F, I send in a ring in the opposite direction because it's closer. And if there's a fault, if we detect the fault from D to E, we can switch over to the other, other link, the other ring. So we can quickly uh, recover. Last one, and especially for LANs, very important today because what we use in wired LANs is a star topology. We introduce a new device in the network. We now have our six stations, A through to F, and we introduce a new device, which is not a station but is an intermediate device. It gets different names, but the idea is we have point-to-point -point links between station and this intermediate device, and we want, when we want to communicate from A to F, we transmit across the point-to-point -point link to the intermediate device, which then sends across the point-to-point -point link to F. This is like switching. Remember in our packet switching, we'd send to an in intermediate switch, which would then send to the next switch. Well, here we just have one switch. And a common name for this intermediate device is a switch. And in a LAN, a LAN switch or an Ethernet switch. The benefit in this case is that we're using point-to-point -point links, the ring, and the bus topology, we have multi-point links and we got lower performance per user. Here, so long as the switch is good quality, that is, it's fast enough, I can be transmitting from A to F at my full data rate and at the same time be transmitting, say, from E to B at the full data rate. If my links support 100 megabits per second, I can be sending at the same time 100 megabits per second from A to F and 100 megabits per second from E to B and 100 from C to D whereas with the shared links that wasn't possible. So much higher performance. That does depend on whether the this switch is fast enough to, to process that traffic and nowadays they usually are. The problem with this is that we've introduced a central node. If this node fails, our whole network fails. No one can communicate. So we have a, a dependence on the central node, which is a problem. If the link from A to the central node fails, of course A cannot communicate, but everyone else can still communicate. So that's okay fault tolerance for the, with respect to the links. If one link fails, it doesn't prevent others from communicating. That wasn't the case with the, the bus and the ring. If the bus fails, generally no one could communicate. So that's a good thing re with respect to fault tolerance. Generally easy to install. We have one central device and from every station we have a one cable going in there. So with a hundred stations we need a hundred cables. With our mesh, with our 100 stations, we needed 5,000 cables. Usually the links actually were, were full duplex or, or two links. That is, what we could do, if A is transmitting data to F at 100 megabits per second, at the same time with full duplex links, F can be transmitting data back to A or to someone else at 100 megabits per second. If we have full duplex links, then we can do that. And that's what we have in most LANs today. So this is used in, in the LANs that we use today. This PC has a LAN cable plugged into it. It goes into the, the socket in the wall, and that LAN cable goes down to a switch, this central node down in a cabinet downstairs, and every other PC connects into that same central node. And we get this star topology. There are, over time, there were variations on what this central node did. In the first versions, it was a, what was called a hub. And the hub was designed such that 
really only one device could transmit at a time. The hub was very simple. But then as the, the, the hardware got better and cheaper, uh, people created a true switch which allowed the, the device to be able to support the data from A to F and the, at the same time from B to E and at the same time D to C. So this central device in today's LANs is called a switch, an Ethernet switch or a LAN switch. You may have heard of hubs, but hubs are usually uh, no longer used because it's the same price to buy a switch as a hub and a switch is faster. So that covers the main topologies we'll see in LANs and s some historical and also we'll see them in, in wide area networks as well. And that's the main thing we want to cover in this topic. Uh, we've introduced and classified different types of networks by different criteria and listed uh, some of the, the common topologies that are for connecting devices together. The last two things in the slides, at the end there's some example network te technologies. You can look through and see the names of some. The, the topic on medium access control, we were not, uh, I think, have time to cover. This is about the ways in which we share point to multipoint links. When we have multiple users wanting to send at the same time, we said that if they all send at the same time, we will interfere with each other. So we want to avoid that. And the ways to avoid that is, well, three basic approaches. Fixed assignment involves either giving the users different frequency. FDMA means frequency division multiple access. We've talked about FDM and TDM, same concepts but with multiple users. If there are two users wanting to transmit at the same time, give them different frequencies. And with different frequencies, they can transmit without interfering. Or TDMA, allow them to transmit at different times. First user transmits, then second, then first, then second. So that's TDMA, time division multiple access. SD, SDMA, space division multiple access, put them in different locations so that when they transmit they don't cause interference. Interference happens at the receiver when two transmissions are received at the same time. With space division multiplexing, say with wireless systems, you can have antennas. So there's two transmitters who want to send to me at the same time. If I have two antennas, one pointed at the first one and the other antenna pointed at the second user, they can both transmit at the same time with my two different antennas. I can receive the two signals without them interfering. Uh, that re requires some directional antennas. CDMA, code division multiple access, requires some extra processing to allow some special coding to allow them to transmit at the same time. The other one, which is of interest because it's used in Wi-Fi, is random access. Don't control who transmits, just let them transmit randomly. So multiple users want to transmit to the access point at the same time, or they follow some rules that says, when I have data to send, I will check if anyone else is sending. I'll listen in. Is anyone else sending now? Uh, no one's sending, then I will transmit. And everyone follows that with a little modification that when I want data to send, I will check if someone else is sending and I'll wait a random amount of time. And I'll wait. If no one's sending, then I will transmit. And everyone does that. And if it's designed well, it allows them to transmit uh, one at a time because if two users wait a random amount of time, they'll usually wait a different amount of time. One will get to transmit first, and when that one's transmitting, the other user will detect that the first one's sending. Random access is used in Wi-Fi and was used in some of the old wide LANs, but not in the current wide LAN. But especially important for Wi-Fi because it's 
a very simple way to allow multiple phones, laptops, computers to transmit without interfering with each other. The key thing for you to remember without knowing how they work, with random access especially, because we only transmit one user at a time, then we must share that medium amongst those users. If my data rate is 100 megabits per second, I have 10 users sharing that medium. On average, each user will get 10 megabits per second, 100 divided by the 10 users. And in your performance experiments with the assignment, I hope to maybe some of you will see that performance if you try multiple users. But that's, we're not going to cover how that works. Uh, what we'll do is next topic, you'll look at wired LANs and Ethernet, a few of the details of Ethernet. We will stop there. We will not go any more through this topic. The next one is on Ethernet.